Rub up your engines! Well, Toyota's now back on the top as the number one seller of cars worldwide. And guess what? Their bet on hybrids is paying off. While all these other clowns are running around, listen to the greeny loonies and the politicians who don't have a whit of sense inside their collective minds said, we're battery electric cars, battery electric cars, all batteries, batteries. No, Toyota's gone to hybrid. And guess what? They're selling the heck out of them. And now other companies like Ford, GM are thinking, gee, maybe people don't want these fully battery electric cars. I guess we're going to have to make more hybrids. They're so far behind what Toyota's done with hybrids. Toyota's been making hybrids, especially the Priuses, for over two and a half decades. They've been making them for a long time. And if you know anything about Toyota, over time they perfect things. The Americans, they make something that didn't work. What do they do? They throw it away and they try something else. GM's putting out. They had to call a stop sale for their big trucks because they were such piles of junk. Car magazines, they got one for a year. They bought it and they're trying it out. And it's got all these codes. They can't fix it at GM. They got such a long way to go go that Toyota's eating their lunch. Let's say you got a partially electric, one of those PHEVs that's a plug-in hybrid, okay? Maybe you want to try a RAV4. It can go 60-something miles on electricity. Great. Great way to try an electric car because when it runs out of electricity, you got a regular gasoline motor that can go like 400 miles more. So you never have to worry about range anxiety. Toyota hit the nail on the head and all these other fools, they were sheep following the head sheep and the head sheep didn't know what the heck he was doing. Well, Kentucky just made a law that you got an electric car, hybrid car, or an electric motorcycle, you got to pay a tax every Year. If you own an electric vehicle, it's 120 bucks per vehicle. If you own a hybrid, it's sixty dollars for each vehicle. And if you have an electric motorcycle, it is sixty dollars for each motorcycle. Now, Kentucky is a commonwealth state, so they can tax whatever they want. That's one of the reasons East Coast, like Massachusetts and stuff, they're commonwealths, and they tax the living heck out of people. Well, Kentucky has a lot of problems to begin with because of this commonwealth and their state tax. For example, here in Tennessee, you see boom, 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 building, building, roads, houses, everything, right? As soon as you get to the Kentucky border, it stops. Goes back to a two-lane road because they tax too much and people aren't moving there like they move to Tennessee, even though they touch each other, right? Well, you might wonder why they put in a tax on electric vehicles. Well, because they said, we got to take care of the roads, and if they're not buying the same amount of gasoline that pays for the road repairs, guess what? The roads will fall apart. Now, I do have to say, the roads in Kentucky are pretty good roads. I drive through there every time I go to Rhode Island, Tennessee, back and forth, back and forth, and I do have to say, the roads in Kentucky, at least the ones I tech on highways are in excellent shape. So you think you're going to save money buying an electric vehicle? Guess what? This is just the beginning of the tax. They'll probably say, well, you know, that's not enough. Let's make it $400 a year, $500 a year, whatever, right? <laughs> just think, the U.S. Internal Revenue Service, their tax was early 1900s, 1%. Well, it's a lot more than 1% now. Well, here's something about batteries that actually intrigues me. They're called flow batteries. And they're thinking, can flow batteries outdo lithium ion batteries? The thing about flow batteries is, instead of having to recharge your battery and wait, they can empty the liquid out of the battery, go to a gas station that does it, it would empty your liquid out, and it would replace it with charged liquid. And then you can go on your way. So, just like a gasoline car, take you five minutes, empty yours out, fill it up with a new liquid, and away you go. They're basing the new liquid technology batteries on nanotechnology. So, of course, yet it's not something they can put in a car. They've had this around for years, but the problem is the normal flow battery is 10 times less efficient, less energy than a lithium ion. So, if you had to make this thing 10 times the size of a lithium ion battery, God, these things are 1,200 pounds in a big Tesla, right? It had to be 10 times that way. You're going to have a 12,000 pound battery. You know, that's kind of ridiculous. But they're trying Trying out now the scientists using nanotechnology, small particles, to make them even more efficient than the lithium ion. Now, if this ever hits the road, it would be a massive change because then you could just go like for gasoline and you could empty your tank out of the liquid and then the new charged liquid comes away in five minutes and you drive your way. Now, realize, as it stands today, it's science fiction and there would be such a massive infrastructure 
interchange that would be needed to hold these charged liquid and then swap them over. But they claim they could move the charged liquid. That's another reason that we might in the future find fuel cells powered by ammonia because they can transport ammonia in big tankers. They can put them in the ground, pump them out, and if they can figure out how to make ammonia create electricity in a fuel cell efficiently, we could be driving ammonia powered cars. And in this case, it would be a special liquid that's an electrolyte that you empty the old dead ones out, pump new ones in. They're trying out with little baby RC cars. <laughs> yeah. The problem is, of course, it's nanotechnology. From my experience with nanotechnology, 99% of it doesn't work. They promise crap that doesn't work. Now, if they did do this, it would be a game changer. Right? And of course, that would be the death of all the electric battery cars that are out now because who'd want to have a car you got to charge up for an hour or at home for 12 hours when you can just go to the station in five minutes, get it charged up, and then the stations themselves, they would have your old stuff that wasn't charged so they could charge it up in a giant place. And then they're spending the time charging it and you're just getting the ready charged one up and you can fill them up like regular cars. Now, like I say, this is way, way in the future. Big infrastructure would be needed. And they'd have to be able to prove they could manufacture them at a good cost and stuff like that. But to me, it's fascinating technology. Barbie says, I want to make an old truck roadworthy again. I got a 1979 Ford F100 Ranger 302 with a C4 three speed tranny. What should I replace to get it ready? I got it running. Replace the carburetor, fuel filter did an oil change. What else should I do if it's not leaking? It's got around 128,000 miles on it. I'd just say start driving it and watch things. You know, make sure the coolant isn't bad, stuff like that. But in 79, those 302 V8s were extremely strong engine. And the three-speed automatic transmissions were simple, right? Now they're gas hogs, of course. You got a V8, three-speed transmission, a carburetor. It's not going to eat gas like no tomorrow. What are your plans with it? If it's a knock-around truck, just drive it and see how it goes, right? Now, if you are planning on using it as an everyday driver, I would go through everything that. I'd go through all the brake systems, replace all the rubber seals, fan belts, all the hoses on the engine and all that. To make it roadworthy, you could drive it a lot, right? Because 128,000 miles is nothing on one of those V8 engines with a three-speed tranny. But if you're just going to use it for a knock-around truck, hey, you've done what you need to do, and then just kind of watch it. Things leak, fix them as time goes on. Turn it into a rat truck. Everybody loves rat trucks, right? They're in now. Like if it's got some rust on it, seal it, and then paint it with clear coat so it just stays that way, and you got a nice rat truck. I kind of like the idea. Rather than being a snob, oh, my shady paint job, look at this, show the rust and seal it so it doesn't rust anymore. Say, yeah, it's an old rusty truck, but it still goes good. And it's got some class. When you clear coat it and it won't rust anymore after you seal it, it looks interesting. Hufford 74 says, my 2011 Dodge Ram will crank but not start when it's warm. Starts fine cold, but when I go to a gas station and fill it up, the vehicle sits about 15 minutes. It'll crank, but it won't start. I'll wait, try again. The second or third attempt, it'll start. I have also depressed the gas pedal, which resulted in it starting. Okay, that's your clue there. You depress the gas pedal and start. When you depress the gas pedal and crank it, that's the stop the flooding way. That's the way to clean up your vehicle if it's flooded out and has too much gas, you do that and crank it. And that's to stop it from flooding because it's sucking a lot more air. And even though it has too much fuel, the extra air will help it start up and run, right? So for some reason, your vehicle is flooding out. Now, you didn't say the mileage. It's a 2011 V6 Dodge. I'm assuming it's relatively high mileage. If so, you either have a leaking fuel pressure regulator or one of your injectors is leaking. And then when you shut the car up warm, it drips gas into the engine and it's flooded out. And so that's why it either takes a long time or when you depress it, it starts because that is the on flood mode. That on floods, it, right? Could be the fuel pressure regulator. Maybe just change that out of gas because they'll often leak, right? And that could easily fix it. Now, there's six fuel injectors. Odds are they're not all going out. Probably one would be flooding it out. So what you do is, when the thing won't start, take out the spark plugs. And if you see one of them is soaking wet and the other are dry, that means the soaking wet one has a bad fuel injector. And you'd have to replace it because it's dripping raw gas. And the reason it does it when it's warm but not cold, a cold engine needs extra fuel. So if it drips extra fuel, no big deal. It needs it, so it'll start up. But if you have a warm engine, it has to run lean and too much fuel dripped in, it won't start. So that's probably what it is. Flooding out and figure out why it's flooding out. Because you said you're ready to replace the fuel pump, so it's not the fuel pump. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.